Hi, my name is Neeta Patel, and today I'm going to give an introduction to Huntington's disease. I recently joined the Rush Movement Disorders Group and uh, also see patients in the Huntington's Disease Clinic here at Rush. Today, I'm going to give a brief overview on Huntington's disease, the approach to treatment, and then strategies on living well with HD. What is Huntington's disease? This is one of the questions that I often get asked by my patients. And I really like the definition that is posted on the HDSA website, which is that HD is a fatal genetic disorder that is caused by the progressive breakdown of nerve cells in the brain. Now, this specifically refers to the term neurodegeneration that you may hear in a doctor's office. It deteriorates a person's physical and mental abilities during their prime working years and has no cure. HD is known as the quintessential family disease because every child of a parent with HD has a 50-50 chance of carrying the faulty gene. Today, there are approximately 30,000 symptomatic Americans and more than 200,000 at risk for inheriting the disease. So this condition was first recognized in 1872 by George Huntington, for whom this condition was named after. He was in first year of medical school and saw a series of patients with uh, chorea, the twisting turning movements associated with HD and wrote a paper that um, identified several key features which still hold to, true today. HD is associated with a constellation of symptoms, including psychiatric changes, motor symptom changes, and cognitive changes. And specifically, some of the symptoms that our patients may experience include impulsiveness in decision-making, depression, anxiety. Psychosis can mean a few different things, um, but often may be in the way of not necessarily recognizing what's real and true versus um, something that they perceive to be, bad, uh, to be in their reality, but is not in ours. Personality changes. Um, Korea, dystonia, incoordination, balance issues, and then memory changes can be um, in the way that I described here, short-term or uh, short-term loss or impaired attention and concentration or poor judgment. Now, uh, there are several motor symptoms associated with HD. And uh, throughout my years, um, a few of my patients have asked me if I do the UHDRS scale. So I always take a minute to talk about what it is and what we're looking for. The UHDRS, otherwise known as the Huntington's Disease Rating Scale, is a research tool that we use to monitor for changes in symptoms in HD. And it's focus is on the motor symptoms, but it it's a, lot, a big scale, so it also evaluates cognitive and psychiatric symptoms as well. Um, the hallmark symptom of HD is chorea, this dance-like fidgety movement, um, but it's not present in every patient. So few patients will have severe symptoms and others will have mild symptoms and rarely a patient may not have chorea at all. So we're looking for a few other um, features including abnormalities in eye movement, a type of incoordination and imbalance that we call ataxia. Um, dystonia is posturing of the limbs due to sustained and abnormal contractions of the muscles that are not working in coordination. Um, muscle stiffness, otherwise known as rigidity, and then bradykinesia refers to slowness or Parkinsonism. Now, uh, the same networks that are affected in Parkinson's disease are also affected in Huntington's, but the problem starts in a different location. And so uh, when we talk about disorders related to movement and specifically Huntington's, we often talk about the basal ganglia, and that's highlighted over here. There are deep structures within the brain that work as a network to coordinate different functions, including normal coordinated movements, um, thinking, memory processing, and a variety of other um, 
functions in the brain. Now, in Huntington's in specific, uh, brain cells in the caudate nucleus appear to be impacted early. And this, it, this nucleus is very important in um, the production of chorea, um, as well as coordinating thinking and mood, which is why we think these symptoms begin early. Now, as the disease progresses, other areas in the network will also become affected and regenerate, and then ultimately um, other areas of the brain outside of the basal ganglia. Now, um, not all patients with chorea will have HD. There are other causes, and often when I'm seeing a new patient with chorea, I'm looking at other treatable causes. Um, many of those could include uh, medications that can cause chorea. Um, sometimes taking away those medicines do not always resolve the problem, um, and syndromes like tardive dyskinesia can occur. Um, pregnancy can sometimes cause chorea, and often when the baby is delivered, those symptoms resolve. Um, infectious diseases such as AIDS or strep throat can be associated with chorea, and strep throat is more commonly a rare occurrence is a rheumatic fever. And this is a combination of a post-infection autoimmune condition where the immune system starts attacking uh, certain areas of the brain to cause this syndrome. Other autoimmune disorders can also be associated with chorea. And then finally, genetic disorders that are non-Huntington's can also be associated with it. Now, uh, our genetic counselor is going to give a very uh, nice talk on um, the genetics of Huntington's, but I always like to spend a few minutes on um, explaining this because this is the foundation of how we diagnose HD. So uh, genes are chunks of DNA that are lumped together to um, code for different proteins that help build, that are the building blocks of our body. Now, uh, we don't understand what the Huntington gene represents um, exactly what function it has, but we know that it's a very important and vital function because it's present throughout the animal kingdom. And when it doesn't work, uh, we can see the manifestations of it in HD. So um, this gene is located on a specific chromosome over here. And uh, naturally it has these CAG repeats. And in the range of somewhere less than 27, this is normal. And the protein that this gene codes for will, um, will be normal. So I kind of think of genes as the, the recipe for a, a protein function. And when the recipe has too many words or asks for too many ingredients that don't work well together, it doesn't taste right and it doesn't work right. And so um, in the when the CAG repeats expand into the range of 27 to 35 repeats, um, the gene starts malfunctioning. But not every patient who has this genetic abnormality in that range will have HD. If, it is thought that if you live long enough, um, these patients will likely manifest into HD symptoms, but uh, it might come on very mildly and subtly in their 70s rather than the 40s and 50s that's, uh, right, that's normally described. And then as uh, the CAG repeats extend beyond 35, uh, if you live, most patients will become affected with HD. Now, um, this is a autosomal dominant condition. And so that means that one affected gene will cause the problem. And uh, we get a set, we get a chromosome from each of our, patient, our parents and each, we carry two of these genes in our, um, in our DNA sets. Um, so what are the clinical features and progression of HD? Well, there are four major phases that we talk about in HD. And the first is the presymptomatic phase. That is somebody who has the genetic abnormality but has no symptoms and um, are functioning normally in life and in school and doing well. 
And then on average in their 40s or 50s, they might start displaying some mild early symptoms, um, subtle in coordination or chorea. Um, but most of our patients in this phase are still working and doing well. They're relatively independent and functioning well. However, as time goes on, um, these symptoms can progress and they enter into the next phase of HD, which is um, more moderate symptoms. Here, our patients are experiencing some disabilities and challenges and often are unable to work anymore, may not be able to drive, um, and may, have, may need some help with some activities like managing finances. However, as time continues to march on, unfortunately, the symptoms progress and our patients develop more substantial disabilities. Often we'll need at least one, maybe two care partners to help them do day-to-day -day activities such as eating and drinking and bathing and dressing. Our patients may have swallowing problems, but also may develop a dementia. So how do we approach treating HD? Well, we recognize that, um, that a team-based approach is probably the best strategy. And so uh, the HDSA really recommends a multidisciplinary approach. And there's a few ways that centers and uh, physicians may approach this. Now, we are fortunate enough to have several of our, special, our specialists in the office with us in our HD clinic. Um, and so we offer a psychiatrist, a neuropsychologist, um, in addition to the neurologist and research team, as well as a genetic counselor and a social worker and a nurse as well. We refer out for specialists like our rehabilitation um, specialists and our nutritionists. Um, now, other centers may not be as resourced as we are and may make referrals for you to go to when the neurologist and or psychiatrists think it's appropriate. So there's several different uh, strategies to approaching care, but it usually requires a team. Um, there are several medications that we can use for the treatment of Huntington's, but I always make a distinction in that these medicines uh, are only to treat symptoms. They do not change the course of HD and they do not reverse the symptoms of HD. They just make your experience with them more tolerable. So we have several medications available for the treatment of chorea, including um, Osteto or D-tetrabenazine, tetrabenazine. Um, then there's a group of medications so, uh, called dopamine receptor blockers, otherwise known as the antipsychotic group. And these are very effective in the treatment of HD. And as you can see, they're in a few different um, categories for symptom tr symptomatic treatment. Um, so sometimes if our patient has more than one symptom, we might use this medication to treat, um, to use one medication to treat multiple symptoms. Um, amantadine is also often used for the treatment of our, our patients with chorea. And as you can see here, each symptom has a tailored approach. So no one individual patient has uh, the same constellation of symptoms. And so therefore we may use different medications to address the needs of each individual. Um, and often we're, we're very fortunate to work with a great psychiatrist. And so often we're pu putting our heads together to say, hey, I, I as the neurologist wanna treat chorea and dystonia. Um, what do you think? What do you think would be the best medicine that could address um, more than one symptom control? So we often put our heads together and uh, approach our patient's care as a team. Now, um, in addition to that, we have a social worker and a nurse and a neuropsychologist. And I just wanted to highlight, I forgot to include the neuropsychologist in the slide. Um, our social worker can help with community-based resources, um, access to charitable foundations if you need something in the home to help care for, to manage your symptoms better, or to help your partner um, help you better. Our nurses can often do lots of education on home safety and uh, identify when it might be time to file for disability. They can also answer some simple medical questions. And our neuropsychologist is um, a valuable tool in the fact that she, 
She can also offer therapy for coping, um, coping with a new diagnosis, a chronic illness, or in various uh, stages of HD, but also does um, cognitive evaluations to identify when there might be thinking and memory problems before they become a problem so that we can kind of prepare for them in advance. And then I, I believe the rehabilitation services are really important. They help maintain good function. They help in, um, improve wellness. Um, and so I, I tend to, and I think my group as a whole tends to prescribe this early and often throughout Huntington's disease. And this can help with a variety of different issues, including strategies to um, accommodate cognitive changes, improve speech um, so that you can express yourself better, uh, improve gait and balance, and also just uh, promote a good positive lifestyle for those early in HD. Um, and then in addition to that, a lot of my patients ask about what diet changes or supplements they should take for, uh, for living their best life with HD. And so I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk about what evidence is out there and what my general recommendations are for patients. So first, um, there have been some studies looking at coconut oil and other fats as uh, value in neurodegenerative disorders. Now, none of this has been done in HD, but it's kind of distilled down um, in the news and other pop culture references as being uh, very valuable for the treatment of dementia or prevention of dementia. And so honestly, there is no research uh, studies that support its use in HD. However, it's available in that and it's available to, to purchase on your own. And so I want you to be better informed. And so I wanna talk about the two types of coconut oils that are available and the ones that I would recommend using. So the first uh, one is the virgin coconut oil. Um, it is cold pressed and comes from raw coconut. This is the least processed version of uh, coconut oil available and the one I generally recommend for cooking with. Um, some people have talked about drinking, you know, large quantities of this as a treatment and there really is no evidence for it. And so what I, I tend to recommend is we'll swap it out with, um, you know, bacon fat or other types of oils which haven't had as much evidence. Now there's another type of oil on the market called copra oil and this is highly processed and all the valuable nutrients out of the coconut have thought to, are, have, are destroyed. And so it really doesn't add a lot of value. So if you are going to choose to add coconut into your diet, coconut oil into your diet, please use uh, the, the cold pressed version. Now coconuts are also really good for you. And so you could also try incorporating more coconuts into your diet and we'll get the natural fats from that as well. And that's probably the least processed strategy. Uh, antioxidants get a lot of press for um, its value in neuroprotection. However, in two studies for compounds that were thought to be neuroprotective, coenzyme Q and creatine, large scale randomized placebo controlled trials across the nation and across the world did not show any benefit over a period of time. So it's hard to know if this will have a value over 30 years because we just haven't done those studies and monitored people in a systematic fashion. So as a general rule, I do not recommend the use of coenzyme Q or creatine, but we know that they're safe. And some of my patients, um, because they're readily available, will pick it up. And what I usually recommend is just let us know. Sometimes there's a medication interaction or in your particular case, it's not the right thing to use. Now, the, uh, there's several other antioxidants like vitamin E and vitamin C. And I want to make the case of saying I found a few um, strategies or a few charts on the internet suggesting uh, which compounds had the best antioxidant properties. And as you can see, there's different food groups, but each list is different. And um, here, carrots don't have a lot of antioxidant properties, but in this chart, they do. So really, my recommendations are to eat a well-balanced, healthy diet that is not 
very process. So the longer something sits on the shelf, the longer, uh, the more processed it is. Food naturally rots, unfortunately. And so the, the less processing that you have, the more natural it is, and those vitamins and nutrients can get absorbed by your body. So uh, eating a colorful diet, um, you know, with green and red and orange and vegetables and fruits are going to be really valuable. And then finally, exercise is really important. So in addition to rehabilitation services, I strongly encourage uh, that my patients get on an exercise regimen. And there's two values to this. One is that um, wherever you're at with good exercise, you can get a little bit better. And as you're having a neurodegenerative process, you have a longer way to fall. So you're, you're stronger at every point in your deterioration as opposed to not adjusting and just starting where you're at and then you just tend to degenerate. So the likelihood of uh, reaching your disability will take longer as long as you're exercising and taking good care of your body. Now, a combination of exercises have been um, looked at and honestly, I think a variety is better than any one single type. So a combination of cardio or aerobic exercise with stretching and strengthening. And a lot of our Huntington's patients um, uh, don't have a lot of stamina, fatigue or tired easily. So rather than working out for an hour at a time, it might be better to work out for 10, 15 minutes a few times during the day. This also helps to set a schedule. If you um, wake up and you do 10 minutes of stretching and strengthening and then go have breakfast and then um, maybe do a, you know, something, uh, some cardio in the afternoon, take a walk or get on an exercise equipment and then maybe have an activity in the evening, this breaks up the day, it breaks up the monotony and it can actually help improve thinking and memory just by having anchors in the day. So I'm a big proponent of exercise um, in all neurodegenerative conditions. So my final recommendations are to eat a well-balanced diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and good healthy meats. Um, I recommend a combination type exercise. And there's honestly very little evidence to support taking supplements in excess. So eat them in their natural form. And with that, I look forward to questions in the Q&A session. Thank you.